All right, hello everybody. It's the Meister from Brews and Tunes. Cheers. I am absolutely thrilled today. I am chatting with uh, guitarist extraordinaire Greg Martin of the legendary Kentucky Headhunters. Uh, Greg, thank you so much for chatting with me. Hello, Victor. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you doing today? Man, I'm fine. I, I've had my nap. You know, <laughs> I've had my nap and uh, um had lunch and I'm going to go do a radio show here in just a little bit and uh, take on the day. I had a, it's been a good day, a little, little chilly out here in Kentucky, but uh, right. anything's better than it was back in January and February. I cannot handle cold weather anymore. So I, it gets pretty cold out there, right? Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. And we're, we have, you know, especially in the spring, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm in Utah uh, spring here gets it's crazy it's all over the board you know you'll have one day it'll be like I think it was last not not yesterday but the Sunday before we got close to 80 degrees and then we dipped into the 30s um, just a few days later so it's it's kind of all over the place you know it might snow you might be wearing shorts it might even all happen on the same day <laughs> absolutely absolutely well it's uh, we're in that transitional weather pattern now it's going to be a little chilly this week but i think towards the end of the week about the time we're on the road again uh it'll be warm hopefully we'll come back into some good weather when we get back from texas on sunday hopefully oh, yeah yeah hopefully so yeah especially if you're traveling yeah hopefully you're yes sir uh, you never know what you're going to encounter on the road that's the thing I, you never know <laughs> yeah definitely um well, uh, so I wanted to ask you, so I know uh, it's been about, what, six six months ago or so, um, the Kentucky Headhunters uh, released their latest album, which I think is, man, it's got to be like the 10th or 11th album, the That's a Fact Jack, which is a yes, sir. phenomenal album. What a great album. Thank you. Very Thank you. fun stuff. Um, so, and I know you guys have started doing some more touring and do more shows. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, things are kind of opening back up around the country. And so what do you have going on right now? Well, uh, we're, we are back touring again. Uh, honestly, we, we, we went back to touring last year. I mean, if you go back to uh, go back to 2019 when everything was still normal as we knew it, we had a really good year touring here in the States. And uh, we even did a little run over in UK with Jason and the Scorchers and Dan Baird and Homemade Sin. And... Um, then we come back and we finished our dates up here. And then, you know, we took off for the holidays. I got really sick uh, 2019 around November. And it could have been, could have been COVID. Don't even know. But I know yeah. I was I diagnosed with COVID in 2020 and uh, it wasn't near as bad as what I had back in 19. So I don't know to this day. Wow. But so anyway, going into 2020, you know, uh, it was going to be a good year. There was a lot of dates on the books and at some point, we we're going to get together and start working towards an album. And um, we did our last official date before the pandemic hit at the Birchmere in Alexandria, Virginia, in mid-February. And then we had a, we we're going to have about a month off. So we came on home. And of course, about a week or two into that little break, um, dates started falling out, dates started moving. And it wasn't very long after that that things start locking down yeah. you know this is 2020 and that whole year of 2020 we had already done about five or six dates early in the year before the pandemic hit so we ended up doing another four or five and i even missed the last day because i had covid but i think 2020 about about 10 shows okay. last year we crawled out of the wreckage we we started a new album you know obviously we couldn't get together i had to been diagnosed with COVID November, mid-November of 2020. And, you know, I had to, had to do the quarantine thing. And at, at that point, it was unsure if you had to do it 10 days or two weeks. Oh, so wow. when I finally, they, they finally contacted me, they had lost my number and they contacted me and said, oh yeah, you, we're clear, you're clear now because we, we lost your number. You actually would have been fine a couple of days ago. So that was the day before Thanksgiving of 2020. And by the time we got to that point, we didn't have time to really get together and rehearse, look at songs, jam, write. So we just said we'd reconvene in January. And due to weather circumstances and the studio moving locations, 
we ended up um, getting together in the studio last year, <laughs> um, 2021, and just everybody brought their ideas, some finished songs, and we tore them apart, put them on the floor, and just hit record until we got the right take. And then we would um, go back and do our overdub. So we finished the album probably last April and got it placed with a distribution company through our own label. And and we worked, we worked about 45 shows last year as well. Mm -hmm. So we did about 45 then, which is pretty good considering we were crawling out of the records in 2020. And then, you know, this year we, we, I don't know how many shows we've done. We've done quite a few and I believe it's going to be a good year. God willing, God willing, yeah. it'll be a good year. Touring. Yeah, like you guys have, yeah, I've, I've noticed, yeah, a lot of shows, uh, a lot of, <laughs> you guys have posted a lot of photos and a lot of videos, a lot of really cool stuff going on. Thank you. Um, in fact, you, uh, right before, you know, we started the actual interview, we were chatting and, and you mentioned a really big show uh that that happened in december that should be airing pretty soon right yeah yeah we uh to to uh cap everything off from last year we did our grand Ole opry debut after all these years you know yeah that's uh, we were, there was some controversy early on about our hair supposedly and uh, <laughs> it never happened then then it was one other offer back i don't know what year it was 20 13, 2014, we were offered to do it again, but they were real sticklers about you using their amplifiers and this and that. And we were just concerned we couldn't get our sound and we politely declined then. But then they came back last year and they were very, very accommodating and worked with us. They were just great all around. And we did the show and it went great. It went great. I mean, I did the Opry back in, the 80s a couple times with Ronnie McDowell. Oh, yeah. uh, actually, Doug was in the band too. And back then they had amplifiers that you had to use and the, the volume knob was epoxy where you could not turn it or anything. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, you had to plug in and just go for it. Uh, wow. I think artists like Ricky Skaggs and a few others could bring amps in, but most of us guys that were in backup bands at the time just had to use those. I think they were PV amps, but I can't remember. But uh, our, our our Opry experience last December was excellent. We loved it. They were great. We got a standing ovation. We did three songs, and it's going to air on the Circle Network, Circle Channel, um, I believe, this month. Excellent. You know, yeah. Did you play, so, uh, you, you meant you played three songs. Did you play new material or did you play some of your classics or? We did a kind of a smorgasbord uh, type of thing. We, we did, a, of course, we did Dumas Walker, you mm -hmm. know, that, yeah. that's our calling card. And then we did a, a song from the Johnny Johnson album uh, that we did many years ago. That'll work. And we, we actually redid it for Meet Me in Blues Land called Stumbling. But mm -hmm. we did another song from the new album that's a fact jack which was a kind of a Christmassy holiday song called Let's All Get Together and Fight, which is the <laughs> which is a song that closes out the new album. Yeah, and it's just fun. a humorous look at uh, how families in this area, and I'm sure it's uh, universal all over the world, get together and somebody can either bring up politics or sports or theology or whatever, and then you get a big fight going at the holidays. You know? <laughs> That's what it was about. Nice. But it but it went over great because it's very humorous. It's not it's not meant to stir any controversy or nothing. You know, we're right. just making fun of ourselves, really. You know. Yeah. Well, that's that's the thing I've always loved about your music is it's always been, you know. I mean, there's some darker things here and there, but for the most part, it's very upbeat and it's yeah. a lot of fun. It's always been fun, you know, from those yes. early days until now. I mean, you know, you know, this it's a long career, you know, fifty plus years really of uh just some great fun music you know and, and well the oh, sorry. yeah if you go back to um fred richard and i we got together in 1968 and we played on and off i mean there was times we would we would split apart to do different things you know because of work or whatever but now the headhunters officially came together in 1986 but right. our history goes way the roots go way back we got deep roots you know yeah, yeah. and most generally you're right the, the songs are very fun songs but um doug writes a lot you know there's no formula but richard writes some really uh i call them mini sermons 
without beating you over the head with a Bible or anything. Uh, they're just deep thinking songs, you know, like uh, Watercolors in the Rain. Yeah. And that's a fact jacker, really got a great message. And he's really good at that, man. He's He would probably have been a preacher if he hadn't got into music. But, uh, but there again, we're not pointing the bible at anybody or anything like that they're just they're right. just songs to make you think you know hey let's get it together let's love each other that's the common denominator yeah yeah and you um you you penned a song and also sang a song and you normally don't do a lot of singing on the album yeah. but you, on this newest album you did uh um you know uh shotgun fe um yeah. uh great song great track so well thank um, you yeah, a lot of fun, a lot of, lot of you know, and, and like I said, yeah, you're usually not, you usually don't yeah. do a lot of singing, but uh, so what yeah. kind of prompted that? What what made you decide, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to sing this one? Well, I wrote the biggest part of the song back in 1973 when I lived in Indiana, and it was uh, an ode to Richard and Fred's grandmother, Miss Effie Young, hmm. who reigns, <laughs> reigns in our hearts because she was very, very, supportive of us just like Richard's parents were uh early on you know we had a band called Itchy Brother of course it went through different names you know we got together in 68 it was called The Truce and then we renamed it uh, Aftermath and then Mandrake Velvet but in 73 it, well actually 74 we changed the name to Itchy Brother named after a cartoon character from oh. King Leonardo and Friends so you can look that up there's uh, Itchy Brother was uh, a lion, and his brother was King Leonardo, who ran Bongo Congo with with uh, his faithful sidekick Odie Coloni, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but Itchy Brother and Biggie Rat were always trying to overthrow the kingdom, so that's where that name comes up. Because they go, "What a name! Where'd you come up with that?" And it's, <laughs> it's just part of our childhood watching that cartoon. Yeah, you know, great. but anyway, going back to 73, I'd started uh shotgun naffy jamming in a basement up in Memphis, Indiana. And musically, it was coming more from a oh gosh, you could mix Mountain, Z early ZZ Top, JoJo Gun, you know, that type of whatever was going on at the time. Yeah. And um, and then I was working, I was also working at a printing company. I, I had moved from South Central Kentucky in uh, June of 1972, took a job at a printing company. Uh, by 1973, end of 73, Richard had called me one afternoon, said that Miss Eppie wanted to give us some money to go in the studio and record a record. Oh, wow. So <laughs> we went to the studio. I had written Shotgun Eppie and I sang it. And Richard had a song called Rock and Roller. And we went and cut both songs at a little studio in Burksville, Kentucky in 1973. I think it was like November 73. I think we'd got together like two weeks prior just to finish up the songs and get the arrangements down and get a bearing what we're going to do. So we went to the studio, cut these two songs. In uh, early 74, they were released uh, like 500 copies on a little 45 on King Fargo Records. Nice. It's just a little custom record. Yeah. And we may have sold 200 copies. Who knows? I don't know. Uh, Richard says we went driving around, throwing them out the window, giving them to people. I can't remember. <laughs> I think it's true, actually. He, he remembers better than I do. But uh, I, so I sang a song. And what happened with last year, Fred kept bringing up Cheap Tequila by Rick Derringer. Uh, he loves the song. Rick Derringer wrote it, I don't know, back in the 70s. And it was on his All-American Boy album. Yeah. And uh, Johnny Winter also uh, recorded on Still Alive and Well. And uh, we cut a track because when we do a cover, we try to bring something different to the table. We don't do a note for note cover, you know. And so we come up with a pretty good music track. And I sang it one time and I just didn't feel good about it. I, I didn't feel it. And I said, Fred, you're into this song. You sing that one. I said, can we try Shotgun Effie? If, if for nothing else, if it don't make the album, we've brought it forward to uh, 2021 and we'll at least have it in our archives, you know, because way back we were just kids 
in the recording. Uh, it, it's real archaic. You can actually go out on the internet, go out on YouTube and look up Itchy Brother Shotgun Effie, and you can hear somebody's uploaded a little 45 up there. Oh, that's great. It's out there, yeah. So we recorded, you know, my, my intention was, okay, let's, let's kind of rewrite it. Let's pull back. Let's make it heavier. And, but as soon as Fred Kelly and off, it went back to 1973. Um, the music track was real close to what we did before. And we just played better. You know, we were just more in the groove. And, and uh, I, since I wrote the song and sang it the first time, that was the reason I sang it. You know, I don't claim to be a singer. I just, I, I sang more in the early 70s, but I just kind of got in bands that always had a singer and, and I just got lazy, I guess. And so, it, you know, it's it's my debut with the Headhunters singing, I guess, <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's great. That's good. It took a long it's time. Just but yeah. it forward from 1973. It's just a part of our roots, man. We just brought it forward. Yeah. I love that. I think that's fantastic. I think. That's, Thank you. And, and that's a great <laughs> honor to her too. And to that, to mm. that family. That's great. Oh, she was so cool. She was so cool. And she did. I mean, she wasn't uh, mean, but she, she didn't take no crap. Right. And she was an old farm lady. She uh, ran a store in Wisdom, Kentucky for many years and just as, but she loved us and she loved her grandbabies and she wouldn't let anybody do anything to them. She would pack a gun around. Um, I think she went to gigs with, I, there was a period I wasn't with the guys, but I think she would like uh, go to shows with them. And she, she had a gun with her. If the promoter or the whoever was supposed to pay didn't pay, I think she would have been a little bit, uh, <laughs> she would help push it to get the thing resolved, you know. <laughs> but I love it. Dude, she's she's she a negotiator. Like, oh, no, she was she was a very supportive of us, and and uh, it's 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 a tribute to her, really, more than anything. Yeah, I, I love that. I think that's fantastic. Thanks. Um, I I wanted to ask you about also. So you mentioned uh, right when we started the interview that you've got a show to get to later on um of course you are uh and have been doing this for geez 20 21 years i think uh the lowdown hoedown well at wdns in bowling green i've been there over 20 years but the roots of the show go back even further than that i've oh. i've been doing this show for about 22 and a half years um I, i'm a dj on on monday nights a blues dj Cool. Uh, I got a I got a radio show called the Lowdown Hoedown at WGS D, WGNS in Bowling Green, a classic rock station, and uh, I started there in November of um, twenty oh two thousand one. That's when it was. I'm trying to remember. I, there's a lot of things to remember. Twenty thousand one, and we celebrated twenty years back in November, nice. and. Actually, the first go around of the show started in, in November 1997 at WVLC in Campbellsville. And I ran up there for about a little over two years, two and a half years. And um, I left there in April of 2000. And that was more or less because uh, my engineer at the time was taking another job. And I, I wasn't used to running the board at that time. And I just said, I'm going to take a break. But then, you know, one closed door is another open door. as a room for an open door. Then I had a, a Brian Locke, uh, just a great guy, a music director at WDNS, uh, just a great person, um, called me one day and said, hey, I'm taking over the reins at D93. Would you like to bring your show to WDNS and I jumped at it, man. And uh, every Monday night from 7 to 10 Central Standard Time, uh, it's a blues show, but we take liberties with the genres. Uh, tonight, it's all about blues, barbecue, and soul food. <laughs> you oh, know? I love that. Yeah, I've called it the uh, uh, barbecue blues and soul food party tonight. You know, Excellent. I've got everything from James Brown, the JVs, the meters, anything is songs about uh, barbecue and blues and, and soul it. food. But ne you know, last week it was Jimmy Reed. Uh, next week, uh, I don't even know. <laughs> I think I think next week, John Smith, one of the horn players 
from Edgar Winter's White Trash back in the 70s is calling in. So I've had some call-in guests, you know, John Sebastian from The Loving Spoonful, wow. Peter Frank, Billy Gibbons, Vince Gill, Marty Stewart. Um, oh, gosh. Uh, Glenn, Glenn Hughes from Deep Purple, a lot of different folks. Wow. But call-ins, I'm, I'm not a real, inter I don't look at it as an interviewer thing. It's more of a music show, but it, I will have a guest every so often, you know, call in. I love that. And, I, uh, I love the, how it's, you know, it's, it's eclectic. It's, and, you know, similar to, I think, yeah. in a lot of ways to the, you know, the music you play. There's there's a lot of different elements. You know, you can't say, you know, you, for lack, you know, you'll see in print, you know, oftentimes, you know, somebody yeah. will just say, you know, the Kentucky Headhunters, you know, country rock band. Like, well, there's so much more to your exactly. sound and what you listen to and what you like. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, like I said, blues and soul and, um, you know, country and, you know, just kind of this great Americana uh, vibe of, of music, you know, and even, even, you know, hard rock and, and even a touch of metal too, you know, I think is, you know, yeah, yeah. there's all sorts of great things that kind of, and, and, you know, uh, rockabilly and yeah, there's, there's, it's, it's a great thing. That's right. You're yeah. correct. You know, you were the old saying, you are what you eat. You are what you, uh, musicians are, what they listen to. It, it uh, you know, it, it comes out in strange ways. You know, you can be listening to, uh, you know, growing up, our, our roots collectively, everybody in the band would tell you that we love the Beatles. And we revered the Beatles. We loved everything they did. You know, the Rolling Stones and, oh gosh, everything had happened back then. Then, you know, when the, uh, big revolution, the psychedelic revolution happened. And, you know, we loved Jimi Hendrix experience, the Kareem, uh, the early Jeff Beck groups and Led Zeppelin and all that type stuff. But what that did, uh, Victor, is that that pointed us back to uh, the, the going back to the well, like uh, listening to Led Zeppelin, you know, you go, uh, uh, I can't quit you, babe off the first album said, well, you know, who's Otis Rush or, yeah, I think Otis Rush did the original version of Willie Dixon could have wrote it. But anyway, we started looking at the um, writing credits and we would see McKinley Morganfield on an Allman Brothers album under Trouble No More. And we'd go, wow, who is that? And we found out that was Muddy Waters. Then who, then a uh, Cream album, for instance, uh, Wheels of Fire, Sitting on Top of the World, there's, Chester Burnett's name there. Who's that? Well, it's Helen Wolf. So we kept discovering people like Helen Wolf, Muddy Waters, Otis Rush, of course, B.B. King, Albert King, Freddie King, you know, and we, we love blues. We love our rock and roll roots, but we also love to go back and discover where, who Led Zeppelin was listening to, which, uh, Led Zeppelin and Jeff Beck and uh, Eric Clapton, they were all into Buddy Guy, early Buddy oh, Guy. Yeah, and I had a chance to jam with him about about, oh, about five weeks ago in Louisville. Oh, wow. And, yeah, I got, got to play with him, and that was an amazing experience. It was like a circle moment. It was like, wow. <laughs> yeah. Know, whole circle. You know, because uh, here's the guy that really influenced Clapton to want to put a trio together because Buddy Guy went to England in the 60s was just a trio. And evidently he just floored Clapton. And, and uh, when they put the cream together, that was his vision. He, mm. he, I know in interviews he said, well, I was gonna be the singer and I was gonna be like the buddy guy of the band. But of course, as he got into that band, Jack Bruce's voice and creativity was so strong that cream become his own identity, you know, came its own thing. Yeah. And um, But I just love discovering what, you know, we, I love Stevie Ray Vaughan, but I love that, you know, he, he's kind of a contemporary of us. We're, we're real close to the same age, and God bless him. He was wonderful. Yeah. Love him. And his brother, Jimmy. But I love, you know, their interviews and, like, what they were listening to. Because, you know, if you listen to Stevie Ray, you knew that he was listening to Albert King, of course, Jimi Hendrix. And he was also listening to Buddy Guy and people like that. Yeah. And, and Jimmy was really into... Uh, a lot of the, you know, Lightning Hopkins and uh, Johnny Guitar Watson, uh, Clarence Gate Mouth Brown. I mean, there's just so many. Music is a deep well. You yeah. just got to dig a little bit, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, that's the, it, it's a good thing, but it's also, 
you know, it's almost a sad thing that that the English had to reintroduce the blues to Americans, <laughs> you know, um, in in a lot of ways, or at least you know, white middle class America, you know, had yes, kind sir. of lost that sound. It didn't really recognize that sound anymore. And, you know, but yeah, you know, as you said, you know, like all of these guys, all these, you know, Led Zeppelin, mm -hmm. Yardbirds, all these bands, you know, the Stones, yes. the Beatles, you know, kind of reintroduced all of us to that sound again, which was, which is great and very important. And I think I was uh, similar for me, you know, when I was, I remember when I was in high school, I really got into Led Zeppelin and Cream and those bands. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I was curious where the roots were because I'd hear things go, ah, this is something, this is a classic yeah. song. And yeah, I did the same thing. I started looking at the, the liner notes and the, the credits and like, oh, Willie Dixon, I need to go find some Willie Dixon or, you know, Howlin' Wolf. Yeah. Or whatever. yeah. And, yeah. And I yeah. fell in love with all that stuff, you know, immediately. Yeah. It's, it's so yeah. rich. Oh, it's a great thing, man, going back and be a student of uh, music in general, whether you, um, I mean, if you just want to go back to rock and roll, man, you go back to the, Johnny Burnett Trio, even the early Elvis, you know, with Scotty Moore and uh, DJ Fontana, Bill Black, you know, the, the Blue Moon Boys, things like that. There's, there's so much great music, you know, r and I mean, I love r and I love, uh, I love like the r and scene from 64 to the late 60s, you know, Wilson Pickett, Aretha Franklin, oh, yeah. uh, James Carr, all that stuff too. I mean, it's just so, it's not just blues, it's everything. Um, and here lately, I got on a kick where there's a guitarist by the name of Scott, uh, Reggie Young, uh, who was a great studio player in Nashville. You've heard him. He's the one that came up with the brilliant intro to uh, Drift Away. You know, the, uh, I don't know if you can hear this. Can you hear that at all? Yeah. He does that. Oh, yeah. He does, you know, he come up with all that stuff and. Uh, son of a preacher man uh he played oh god he played on so many things but some of these side men I, I study those guys you know of course cropper steve cropper and all the guys out of muscle shoals and reggie young the guys that played over at american music uh in memphis there's just so you know man the, the, it just keeps going on and on you can never learn it all you know and yeah. i think that's what keeps me going man is to to, to make new discoveries musically well as, as you said it's it's a deep deep well that's that's, that's oh great. it is that's, it is well and, I, and what i love so much about the fact that you're you know one that you, you're you you're a historian in, in terms of this but you're also introducing this music on your show which is great especially in this day and age when a lot of radio is now corporately owned mm -hmm. you know they they have a production person that basically you know tells you know, the DJs, what they're playing, and, you know, we've kind of lost that, you know, because I, I remember, you know, as a kid listening to DJs and they would introduce, you know, new music and things That's right. that I had never heard before. Whereas now a lot of stations, at least here where I am, everything kind of sounds the same and you've heard it all before. And, you know, there's, and apart from like, you know, like a radio for, you know, a, 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 a station that's, you know, independent, you know, like a small independent station that can play sure. whatever they want, do shows. That's um, but yeah, it's kind of sad when you, when you lose that. And, and it's sad too. I think that, uh, you know, the youth don't have kind of what we had as, you know, these DJs that really impacted, you know, and introduced us to music that we would never have heard before. Um, exactly. Exactly. Well, I grew up just like you did. Um, uh, I was, I started listening to AM radio hmm. and AM radio in the sixties was way different than, what you would think it was uh, in Louisville. I grew up in Louisville uh, for for many years, and um, I mean they would be playing Tammy Wynette, David Houston. The next thing you know, they might play Arn Butterfly <laughs> <laughs> right after that, and All then right. Wilson Pickett. So it was just a great burgoo of music, you know. In Louisville, uh, that you know, I heard the Beatles in 1964, and I got really interested in guitar, and then. I was always listening to radio in Louisville. We had great radio stations like WAKY, WKLO, which were the rock stations. And we had a great country station, WTMT. Then it was a great soul station, WLOU. And, and I, I just became a student listening to those stations. And then when we moved from Louisville at the end of 66, we moved down to Metcalf County, which was a great thing to happen because I met Richard Fred, 
just about a year or two later. But we moved on this uh, little farm, which where we weren't farmers, but we, uh, my dad guys got fed up with Louisville. He quit, quit his job at uh, a printing company and he wanted to go back to where he was from. And we moved to a very rural area. And the radio station in the next county over, which was a great rock station, WCDS, it would lower its power around six o'clock. And then you would hear it no more over in Midcalf County. But then after that, you'd start hearing Chicago stations come filtering in WLS, WCFL. And then you might hear a WOWO out of Fort Wayne, Indiana. You'd hear a Nashville Soul Radio, WLAC. You'd hear stations from New Orleans come in. You'd hear stations from New York. But one of the big revelations for me uh, in 1968, the winter of 1968, I tuned in to WCFL out of Chicago one night, and there was a underground show called the Subterranean Circus, mm -hmm. and uh, it was uh, hosted by Ron Britton, who I found out later in life was a Kentucky boy from Louisville, and we become really close friends. But he was playing a lot of great underground stuff, and I learned so much from him. But I just became a, a student from the radio and records and watching TV. But uh, it was just a uh, radio was just something that was ingrained in me early on. I just wanted to play with it. I, I, you know, I didn't have enough confidence early on to jump into it. But of course, the guitar was supposed to win out. Yeah. So this this is my the thing I get to do for fun every Monday night. And uh, it's a good station too, because it's independently owned. You can, it, it live streams. It's a oh, WD, yeah, WDNSFM.com. So if you listen tonight, uh, are you on Central or Mountain Time? I'm on Mountain Time. Well, if you, uh, you guys on, well, you can do, everybody can do their math. It's uh, seven to 10 on Central. And I'll be doing my thing tonight from seven to 10. And, uh, if I'm not there, if I'm on the road, there'll be a there'll be a few Mondays I will be on the road. We have some shows taped in the can, and we we just keep it going. You know, nice. that's great. it's a blast. Have fun, man. Yeah, that's great. Um, you mentioned uh, you know, in '64, you heard the Beatles, and and you wanted mm -hmm. to play guitar, and of course, you know, you play, you know, both electric and acoustic guitar. You also play steel guitar and um, you know, slide guitar and bass. Uh, so I was curious, did you know, apart from that inspiration from the Beatles, did you come from a musical family? Were, were your parents musicians? Um, you know, was music prevalent in, in your house as a child? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, both sides of my family were musical. Uh, my mother's side were more, well, they all, they, they all were steeped out of country and bluegrass, both sides of the family. They came out of, a, you know, my, my father's side, they were, my grandfather was a sharecropper pretty much until he moved to Louisville and did other work. But um, my uncle Wade on my dad's side, he was a um, kind of a honky tonk country singer and he wrote really good country songs. He had some regional success. He actually wrote uh, high step and daddy on our first album. Oh. And of course that album sold 2 million copies and it paid his house off. That was like a, a nice little payback to uncle Wade for, taking me around all the, I used to, when, when we moved back down here, when I would go back to Louisville for visits, he, if it was a Saturday night, he would be playing somewhere like at a jamboree and he, he let me tag along and hang out, you know, and he was a big influence. And then my, uh, my brother played guitar. He was more into rock early on than 1968. He switched to bluegrass, which was very fortunate for me because he, Handed down me all these rock records, oh. his great silver jet from the 50s and a magnetone amplifier oh, and wow. some really cool records. But then, um, oh, gosh, my dad played a little bit, not a whole lot. So there was always music around my house. Uh, on my mother's side, mostly uh, those those uh, her folks mostly played like string instruments like banjos and just acoustic guitars, mm -hmm. more bluegrass type of stuff but it was around yeah definitely a big influence around the house nice wow that's great that's great yeah and it, and, and what's cool you know you mentioned those different styles of music and obviously that kind of shines through with you know your yeah. writing and and you know it sounds probably similar i'm guessing to you know the young brothers 
you know, as far as their upbringing too, with music, you know, kind of all of that, you know, yeah. you all those different styles of music and, um, you know, kind of all coming yeah, together. They, they, their, their dad was very musical. I, I, I'm sure Gwen played piano, but James Howard, uh, their dad was very musical. He was a brilliant man. And, um, and I know that Miss Gwen, Richard's mother, Richard Fred's mother, she loved blues. And she listened to John R. on the radio, just like 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 a lot of us did, you know. And yeah, there was a lot of music around their house too. I don't know if if country music was around them as much it was my house. Uh, uh, I'm sure they, they there were some people that worked on the farm a little bit for them. They probably listened to. Yeah, I mean, you couldn't escape country around here, right. you know. In the late sixties, man, we wanted to be the a hillbilly version of Led Zeppelin or Cream or something, but you know. As soon as we open our mouth, we go, oh, and we hear our voices back on tape. We go, I think, I think we're from the country, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> you know? And it later on, we finally figured out, well, we can't be Led Zeppelin, we can't be Kareem, we can't be the Beatles, so we just got to be ourselves, right. you know. But, but all those influences from everybody that we were around, what was floating in the air musically on the radio, uh, the records we were buying, it all just came in and. Then we, it comes back out a different thing altogether, you know. Yeah, yeah. It goes through the filter, so to speak. Right, and and magic happens. Uh, you know, yeah, it, it is amazing. Yeah, There's it's some... amazing how that happens, man. Because, man, if you're a, we're all antennas, you know, and if you're, if you're uh, diligent, those songs they're up there in the air. They'll they'll come they'll come down and. We're receivers, you know. It's it's funny how that happens. Well, on a good when you have that kind of talent all together. I mean, you know, you and the and and the young brothers and 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 Doug as well. I mean, you're, I mean, just such a tight band and a tight knit band. But it just seems like, uh, you know, and I've never seen you live, but I've seen a lot of live footage, and yeah. it seems like you guys really play off of each other really well. We do, um, you know, like really comfortable on stage together. We are. Um, yeah. And it's, 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 it's a joy to watch because, you know, and that's the thing, you. you know, for me, when you watch a band that you, you can tell when they love what they do and the Kentucky headhunters, when you see a live performance, you know, this band loves playing live and playing live together, which, yeah, is, yeah. which is a cool thing to see. I think the band, you know, and, and, you know, I mean, we don't have the agility and, you know, we're, we're older now, you know, than we, you know, when we first started, we, we were all over the stage and stuff like that. But I, I have to admit, I, I love playing now more than I've ever played because it, there again, I still live for, you know, learning something new and go, oh, wow, you know, and I don't, I, I know that very, I just know just a little bit and, and, uh, but I just, I've been having fun here the past few years just playing, you know, we, um, I think I think the pandemic really brought some things home, uh, and I've had a I had a health ordeal back in I don't know if it was 2015 I think where I woke up one day and I had pinched a nerve and I couldn't I couldn't couldn't bend the string. Oh wow! I couldn't do that. Only thing I could do I could take a slide and I could do this num you know. I could do that. So for about a month, we had a couple of guys from a group called Otis come out and kind of infiltrate the band and play with us a little bit. And I would place my leads on slide. So things like that. And then, you know, the pandemic, you go, how lucky are we to get to do what we do? And people allow us to entertain them. So we're very grateful bunch too, you know, and love playing music. Yeah, man. You guys are so good. It's so, like I said, Thank it's a joy to, joy to hear you guys and watch you guys play. Um, I wanted to ask you, I saw, I can't remember, it was a while ago. I saw you on, I don't even know what it was. It was some show, I think, and you were talking about vintage guitars. And I wondered, yeah. you know, what kind of, do you have a large vintage guitar collection or? Uh... Well, I, I used to have a lot bigger collection of vintage guitars. Uh, I still have a few. I could show you oh. a few oh, things. Wow. Oh, wow. Uh, this is where I do my live stream for together.co every now and then. So this is kind of my little area. 
that's a 58 Les Paul. Ooh, nice. With, uh, real PAFs. Uh, that was a gift from Hank Jr. Kinda. I trade. We did a little trade. Uh, this belonged to Travis Womack, a st- session player out of uh, out of um, Muscle Shoals. Played on Mac Davis. Th- this guitar has been on Mac Davis Records, Osmond Brother Records, Donnie Marie Records, Soul Records. This is a sixty. For ES-335 Gibson. Nice. Uh, this is a 1957 Strat. One of the, the best Strat I've ever owned. Great Strat. And um, this is a 1962 ES-335 uh, with PAF pickups. And I don't know if you could see that. Yeah. yeah. This is a 1964 ES-345 that belonged to Ed King. Wow. And um, this is right here is a... Um, what they call a Pearly Gates reissue. It's one of Billy Gibbons' copies. Oh. Tom Murphy, night number 50. Uh, I've got a few guitar, other, I mean, I've got other guitars, several. Uh, but I, I, at one time, I had a huge, I thought, I mean, I did have a bigger vintage collection, but as I've gotten older, I had thought I, I need to, to uh, downsize a little bit, you know. This right here is just, a, it's a reissue, 53. Telly, no, and I've had I've had two Blackguard fifty threes real ones. I've had nineteen fifty seven White Guard Tellys. I've had two or three. Oh gosh, I had a fifty nine White Guard. I had a uh, some some sixties uh, Rosewood necks. This is probably the best Telecaster I've ever had. Right here, wow, nice. it's just just a just a reissue. It just it's one that I love this guitar. Yeah, but, you know, a nice warm rich so, sound to it. I've, I've just come to the conclusion I love old guitars and I, and I've championed them for a long time, but I think uh, they're making great new guitars and I can get what I, it's really, you know, the sound is coming from your heart to your hands anyway. You know, everybody was born with the sound. Uh, it's just the way that if the guitar feels good and has a good tone, it, it inspires you, you know. Yeah. It don't matter if it's old or new because there's a lot of vintage guitars out there I've had some that I go after a while ago. Say it just don't play like I want it to. It don't play like butter, as they say, yeah. you know. Yeah. And uh, I got I got rid of them, you know. But man, it's, you know the instrument. You know the instrument is a tool, so the music is you. So right. We're receivers. Let it come out, and this is just a tool to get it out there. Yeah, I love that. That's great. I, do you have a preferred instrument to play live? When you when you toured you oh yeah yeah I've kind of zoned I've got a, I've got a uh, a Ronnie Montrose Les Paul that Gibson made copies of his guitar his fifties mm-hmm. burst it's called a CC twenty eight I I use that live uh, I also use one of my uh, Gibson made a copy of my nineteen fifty eight it's called a uh, collector's choice number fifteen a CC fifteen I use that I use this out live right here. Hmm. And uh, I've got an Esquire copy, a 50 Esquire copy that I'll start taking out as well. So those are the three or four guitars I take on the road with me. And I use a Germino Headroom 100 uh, head. Uh, I've got a Marshall 1975 head out on the road. And I've got a, a Marshall cabinet. And I'm real, real simple setup. I just plug straight in, turn on 10, and turn the cabinet sideways. And I work on my volume control, man. Off my volume control. I play like all my heroes did, like Paul Kossoff and Eric Clapton, Jimmy Page. No, I don't hardly use effects at all. Maybe a wah wah every now and then. Right. You know? Yeah. I was gonna say it seems like it's yeah, it's very pure. Um, you have a very pure sound. Um, do you do you use the same instruments for recording, or do you have uh, preferred in- instruments for um, recording? Well, a recording. No, that, that changed. We'll go, I'll, I'll run back over here. Um, this fifty-eight Les Paul does a line line share of my recording. Oh, okay. Um, this guitar here was used. Richard used this quite a bit. Hmm. Um, the fifty-seven Strat gets used a lot, uh, and this sixty-two is through thirty-five. So you're you're pretty much looking at the A team right here. Yeah, that's the A team for the studio. I don't take these out on the road anymore. They just don't go on the road. Um, I did use a newer Gretsch Silver Jet on. Shotgun Effie on the rhythm track, and I've also got a, a Ventura Dan Armstrong copy that I use for slide, and you know, and there's and I 
I do have several. I probably got 30, 40 guitars, not as many as I used to have, but I've kind of honed down to some guitars I could just enjoy playing, you know. And some some are in the studio. I, I, I don't like taking the old ones out on the road anymore. It's just no sense in it because yeah. something could happen to them, you know. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, God forbid. Yeah, you wouldn't want you know, right. one of those yeah. beauties disappearing. And the amps change in the studio too. I use, uh, matter of fact, I use uh, this 1969 Marshall head has been with me ever since picking on Nashville. Oh. A lot of everything I do, it's on the new album. Plus, I got some old Tweed Fender Deluxe amps that I used on that is on the new album as well. But this amp has been with me forever. It's like supposedly this is the first Marshall amp that was imported into Kentucky. Uh, to a group called Elysian Field in Louisville back in 69. So oh, nice. I, I was lucky to get that amp. And it's just a great amp, man. It really is. That is very I can play anything on that. Country, rock, you can get heavy on it, whatever you need, you know? Nice. I love that. That's great. Um, so uh, you guys have some upcoming shows, right? You got some stuff coming up here pretty mm -hmm. soon. We got lots of shows. You can check us out at uh, www kentuckyheadhunters.com or kentuckyheadhunters.net uh let's see i did a live stream yesterday so i can tell you because i was talking about it yesterday uh, thursday you know i'm not uh this thursday we're going to be in tulsa oklahoma we're going to be in oklahoma for two shows we're going to be on the um the ninth we're going to be in red river the red river music festival in white right texas and um, we're all over the place. Just check our schedule out because it's changing quite often. Yeah. So, so, I mean, some of the, I mean, I can give you these dates, but I'm not sure when this is, this right. will hit, if people will get to see us or not. It may be, I, you know, it may be over with, but then, you know. Yeah. 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 You never know. So, um, and uh, for, for those watching uh, yes. this, this um, I'll have a description. If you look below in the description, I'll have links to the the pages as well, uh, your Facebook, you know, the Facebook page as well as the, yeah. the website, mm -hmm. so people can check that out, check out the events that are going on, and uh, and go from there. So, um, well, Greg, this has been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. It's been today. a pleasure. I really appreciate pleasure, your time. Um, appreciate it, man. And one other thing, I do twice a month. That, that if, if there's a guitar freak out there watching this, uh, there's a, uh, a subscription service called Together. And let me let me spell it out for you folks. It's at number two, G T H R dot co, together dot co, two G T H R dot co. Uh, twice a month, I sit right here, and I play and I talk to people, and we go back and forth. It's really cool. Like Charlie Starr does uh, his own show. Hmm. Um, Oddly Free does a show. It plays with uh, Cheryl Crow. Oh, gosh, uh, there's a lot of players, um, a lot of folks. But uh, twice a month, I do that for together.co. And uh, check that out. If you're a guitar yeah. freak, if there's a trial. You can try it. You can do it on trial and see if you like it or not. You know, it's right. fun. To, yeah, I did one yesterday. Next one I do is on the 24th at 5 o'clock Central right. Standard Time. So right. that's another. We're on Instagram. I'm on Instagram uh facebook you know we're very easy to find and uh please stay in touch with us yeah definitely yeah great stuff uh yeah thank you so much greg this has been a pleasure have a great evening have a great radio show tonight and uh hopefully we'll talk to you again soon all right thank you victor god bless